Hi again, everyone. Lecture number two. So thanks for sitting through that whirlwind of political history from 1492 to 1763. Remember, I know I move very quickly, and some of you might be sitting there like, what? What, what just happened? Um, two things I would suggest. One is um, search around the internet. You know, if you're really interested in one of the events I described, the Protestant Reformation, the defeat of the Armada, um, the um, reformation of Europe after uh, the Peace of Westphalia, you can Google these things. There's some really good, interesting reads uh, that you can find from sources as elementary as Wikipedia, which is a great place to start, uh, to things that are even more complex you can find uh, through Google, Google Scholar. Um, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a taste about political history up to 1763. The one thing I think you can note about European, Western European political history to 1763 is that perhaps the biggest question that European, Western European people had to decide for themselves about systems of government was what powers the monarch was going to have. That is, in almost all of our Western European kingdoms, you had a monarch who, after 1648, was an absolute monarch, meaning that they had absolute control. They decided things like taxes. They decided what religion their people were or were not allowed to practice. And what we have after 1763, or maybe even during the English Civil War that's going on uh, just at the same time that Westphalia is being worked out, is a debate whether absolute monarchy is actually the best system of government. And so this is what leads us into our Age of Revolutions, right? What do historians mean when they talk about the Age of Revolutions? They mean a period of time that comes after this formation period, right, from 1492 to 1763, a period in time that comes after that formation period where people begin to have revolutions against the idea of absolute monarchs. And we're going to look at three specific revolutions and kind of talk a bit more broadly about others. And all of them have one thing in common. They are anti-monarchical, meaning that they are against the idea of monarchy and especially against the idea of absolute monarchy. So we're going to start first with the American Revolution for two reasons. One, I think all of us are most familiar with it. So I don't have to do the same kind of background work I will do with the French and the Haitian Revolution and the Latin American Revolutions. But two, chronologically, it's also the first. Um, and the American Revolution, the first shots fired at Lexington and Concord, you know, the shots heard around the world, um, those came in 1775. But the American Revolution was probably working itself out for a bit longer than that dating at least back uh, to 1763. So this American Revolution, right, it was specifically fought between 1775 and 1783. It was an anti-colonial revolution led by leading American statesmen. While it ultimately achieved its main goal, which is independence, and a functioning Republican government, meaning that there was representation, there was democracy, and there was the rule of law, it wasn't as revolutionary as we might think, because the same people who were in charge before the war are the people who were in charge after the war. And this makes the American Revolution much, much, much different from the French Revolution or from the Haitian Revolution. And historians like myself would argue that actually the American Revolution isn't much of a revolution in its purest sense as you might think. Importantly, because although it got rid of colonialism, it didn't create any new ruling order. Americans were probably at their most British in 1775, right when the American Revolution started. And the new republic that they create, although it doesn't have a monarch, actually looks a lot like the Great Britain they had left. So let's look a little bit about English colonialism before we dive into the revolution itself. The English got into the colonial game almost a century after the Spanish had been doing it. They really began trying to build colonies in, in the 1580s under Queen Elizabeth I, just before the defeat of the Spanish Armada. But these early colonies were all failures. They tried to establish one in what's today Newfoundland in Canada. They tried to establish one in Roanoke Island, which is now in North Carolina, but the first successful colony developed at Jamestown, which is now in Virginia, in 1607, and it was followed a little bit later in the 1630s 
by a colony in what's now Massachusetts. And these were the earliest uh, British colonies. Eventually, they'll have 13 mainland colonies, but they'll have 26 total North American colonies. So only half of the colonies that the British have in 1775 join the revolution uh, that begins in those 13 mainland colonies in 1775. So how do the British view their colonies, right? We've talked a little bit about how the Spanish colonized in the New World. We've talked a little bit about how the Dutch had trading post empires in the Indian Ocean. And the most important thing is that the British practiced a colonial process that was kind of like a combination of the Spanish and Dutch colonial practices. They were interested in both trade and populating the New World. The British will not, by any means, uh, promote the idea of racial mixing, right? The British don't want a racially mixed empire. They want a British empire. So they won't copy the Spanish uh, in the racial mixing process, but they will practice settler colonialism. So what does this mean? If you look at this map right here, you'll notice that Britain, you know, what is today Great Britain, Wales, uh, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, they're all islands. But the British had a, a rising population. And so what the British first did was that they moved people from England and Scotland and Ireland and Wales. They moved kind of poor landless people over to the colonies. The colonies acted as a sort of a release valve for the overpopulation uh, of the British Isles. And it was an incredibly popular option for a transient population to pick up their things and if they could afford it, buy their way to the New World. And if they couldn't, go to the New World under indenture, meaning that they had to work for certain contracts, normally for about seven years, before they were granted land uh, and their freedom. So the British are going to move populations, especially landless and poorer people, over to the New World. At the same time, they're interested, like the Dutch, in creating a very vibrant trading system with their colonies. And one thing that the British are going to practice, especially after 1763, is the practice of mercantilism. And mercantilism means that you're interested in taking raw materials, whether they be tobacco, uh, wood, coal, what have you, from the New World, bringing them back to Europe, back to England in particular, making these into finished products. So whether that's household furniture, clothing, um, tobacco that could be smoked, sugar products, right, refined sugar, rum, all sorts of different finished products, and then selling them back to the New World. And what this meant, and back to your colonial populations, and what this meant was that people in England, especially entrepreneurs who were importing raw materials, finishing them, and then selling them back to the colonists, were making a fortune. Uh, and they were becoming incredibly wealthy, as was the English government, much like Spain had done earlier. They were interested in extracting all sorts of raw materials from the New World, refining them and becoming rich from them. And England was able to build a very powerful navy, a very powerful army, a very powerful monarchy because of the riches that were extracted from the New World. And a lot of colonists, especially after 1763, began to say to themselves, wait a minute, this process isn't fair. Why aren't we getting as rich as our colonial, as our um, metropole counterparts, as our counterparts back in England, right? They began to see themselves as sort of second-class citizens, which, by the way, according to English law, they were not. English colonists, just like their um, counterparts back in England, were guaranteed the same rights and protections under ancient institutions like the Magna Carta. And so colonists began to ask themselves, especially after 1763, well, why aren't we being treated the same as our cousins in England? So you might ask yourself, why 1763? Well, look back to our first lecture, right? The English had kicked out the French from North America, and a lot of colonists were really glad about this, right? This is why I said they were most English uh, after 1763. The English had forever, the English colonists, had been fighting against French colonists in North America. French colonists from Quebec, especially, were seen as a threat uh, to British colonists in North America. They were Catholic, whereas English colonists were Protestant. They were French-speaking, whereas English colonists, of course, spoke English. And they were also really close allies with Native Americans, one thing that the English colonists were certainly not. 
the English colonists had fought against the Native Americans, and they believed that the French, in addition to being Catholic, in addition to being threatening to their land, were also allying themselves with the Native Americans. Well, in 1763, the British kicked out the French government from North America, but they did not remove French colonists. Instead, the British government in London decided that French colonists could stay in North America, could keep their French language, could keep their Roman Catholicism, could maintain their alliances with Native Americans, and, if you notice on this slide, they also drew a line, a proclamation line, right along what's now the Appalachian Mountain that forbid any English colonist from buying land or moving west into what's now the Ohio country and the Mississippi Valley region. And this greatly angered American colonists. Men like Thomas Jefferson, Washington, Adams, right, began to wonder to what extent they were being exploited as colonists by the British government and to what extent their rights were not being allowed. And because... King George III had racked up a tremendous amount of debt fighting the French in North America, he decided that he had to tax the colonists in America at a higher rate in order to pay back some of this debt that he believed they owed England for protecting them against the French. And of course, even though um, the British colonists in North America remained the least taxed colonists in all of the British Empire, they saw an increase in taxes as a direct threat to their own personal liberties, especially because they were being taxed without being represented. Now, taxation without representation is not what the American Revolution was all about. It was also about land ownership. It was also about slavery. It was also about Native American alliances. It was also about the French threat. But taxation without representation became the major rallying cry of most uh, American colonists. And so what happened is, in 1775, tensions had been boiling since 1763, so for more than a decade, fighting breaks out in perhaps the most revolutionary area, which is Massachusetts. But the British are, are driven out of New England fairly quickly. By 1776, even before the Declaration of Independence, right? When the war begins, it's not about independence necessarily. But even before 1776, the British are kicked out of New England. And as you can see from this map, most of the fighting occurs in the Mid-Atlantic, so in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, parts of New York, and also the South, especially here in South Carolina. Uh, there was a lot of fighting at Charleston, Cowpens, Kings Mountain, Savannah, and Georgia also had major battles. And what happens is the British are driven out. The war is far from, um, uh, far from bloodless. It is the bloodiest, bloodiest American war until the Civil War. Uh, in terms of percentages of Americans that fought, uh, it's the bloodiest uh, uh, until the Civil War, and it's the most costly until um, Vietnam in terms of real money. And, and so you see this fighting stretches from all the way up in New England down south uh, through Georgia. And what's the effect of the revolution? Well, Americans eventually decide that, listen, this war began about a protest, but becomes something about independence. And independence is gained uh, in 1783 when the British... Um, capitulate to the United States. And the 13 colonies eventually form their own separate governments, but that's a total disaster. And they eventually adopt the Constitution to create one new nation. George Washington, who had led the Americans, uh, is now the president. But as you notice here, this new government isn't that different than the government that the colonists had under Great Britain, right? They have a president who's not a king, but very similar. They have a judicial system that's almost exactly the same as Great Britain's. This new Congress looks a lot like Parliament. It has the power to tax. It has the power to t pass laws. The men who read, led the revolution are the same men who end up uh, in running the government after, after the revolution. You'll see how different this is uh, than the French Revolution. And perhaps, as the textbook rightly notes, nowhere is this more evident than in the, the position of women. Uh, women played a very big role in the American Revolution. Uh, women boycotting during the increasing taxes that were put on by the British. Women's boycotts were really fundamental to ensuring um, that the American boycott system as a whole was popular. But after the war, despite the fact that women fought, that they raised children on their own, they managed farms, they participated in boycotts, after the war, women are totally neglected. They maintain no property rights. They get no right to vote, except for a small loophole in New Jersey that exists only for a moment. Uh, they're not allowed to sign contracts. They don't have any legal authority over their family. And so pay attention to this when we move to the French Revolution, which is far more revolutionary. 
even though it's more revolutionary, doesn't have the same effect, 